There are places in this world that are filled with mystery, where stories become legends. The Bermuda Triangle is a section of the Atlantic Ocean off of North America, roughly bounded by Miami, Puerto Rico, and Bermuda. Unexplained disappearances by ships and planes have led to many theories about this stretch of ocean. One of these stories is Flight 19. Flight 19 was the designation given to a group of five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers led by U.S. Navy Lieutenant Charles Carroll Taylor that disappeared over the Bermuda Triangle on December 5, 1945. Ultimately, all 14 airmen on this flight were lost, as were 13 additional crew members of a search plane that was subsequently dispatched to search for Flight 19. On this flight, we recreated the intended course of the missing airmen leaving Fort Lauderdale International, the site of the former naval air station from which they departed. Our recreation occurs at the exact time of their scheduled departure and on December 5, 2020, the 75 year anniversary of their disappearance. After they flew on a heading of 91 degrees for 56 nautical miles, they reached Hen and Chicken Shoals where low level bombing occurred. This was known to be completed because at 1500 a pilot requested and was given permission to drop his last bombs. These radio conversations could be overheard by the base and other aircraft in the area. The next leg of the exercise, Flight 19, was to continue on the same heading for another 67 nautical miles before turning on a new heading of 346 degrees near Great Stirrup Key. Okay, back into the nothing. You want me to make them for you? Yeah. Here you go. Plane picnic over the Bermuda Triangle. The wave it too. We're going to fly right over that cruise ship. Alright, so we just turned onto a heading of 346. This is when it sounds like they got lost. They were supposed to turn on this heading for 73 miles, flying over Grand Bahama Island. I hear ghosts on the radio. What? You hear the ghosts on the radio? The, the, the whistling? Yeah. Let's just listen and see what we hear. Is it ghosts or aliens that are supposed to be in the Bermuda? Since they disappeared because they were... <coughs> they got choked out. <laughs> They're trying to keep you telling the story. 
you guys hear that also? I hear it. Yeah. All right, that's cool. I don't know what that is. So, oh it's ghosts. <laughs> Not aliens. Oh but let's just listen and see what we can hear. You just said. Just listen. I would be thrilled if something cool came through. Just listen and let's see what gets said. Hey. Oh my god. <laughs> This is the part where they went missing. And this is the time that they went missing. So. I want to get missing. You want to get missing? I don't want to get missing. No. <laughs> I said I didn't. Oh, you know how to make sure you don't go missing? Yeah. You give me one of those Oreos. Give them. Now. It's the <laughs> only way to live. It's the only way. Why, thank you, young lady. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Are we going to have any more islands coming up soon? Yeah, we get to fly over this giant island by 346 degree heading for 73 miles over Grand Bahama Island. So when you look out in front of us, if you see how it's starting to change colors to brown, it looks like there's a thin little whitish brown stripe. Yeah. That's Grand Bahama Island. So they were supposed to fly over Grand Bahama Island and then fly back to Fort Lauderdale. There was, after the bombing, another flight instructor, Lieutenant Robert Cox, got an unidentified transmission from an unidentified crew member. Anyway, they asked Powers, one of the other pilots, for his compass reading. Powers which there were four pilots. It was Edward Powers and George Stivers, who were Marine captains. And there was Second Lieutenant Forrest Gerber and U.S. Navy Ensign Joseph Bossy. Uh, hopefully I've pronounced those right. Okay. But anyway, Powers was one of the guys who was in the squadron that Taylor was leading. Well, they asked Powers for his compass reading, and Powers said, I don't know where we are. We must have gotten lost after that last turn. The last turn was the turn we just took. So now they were lost. We've got GPS to help us cheat. We've got redundant systems. They're all working at the moment. They but just had compasses. They just had compasses and the compasses weren't working normally. The gentleman Robert Cox I told you about, he says, this is Fox Tango 74, plane or boat calling powers, please identify yourself so someone can help you. And that's when Taylor came on and said, both of my compasses are out. I'm trying to find Fort Lauderdale. That was the message I was telling you about earlier where he says he thinks he's over the keys. So he was seeing these islands and he thought he was over the keys. He was not over the keys. So. Uh, Lieutenant Cox informed the Naval Air Station that the aircraft were lost, advised Taylor to put the sun on his port wing, and fly north up the coast. So we have the sun on our port wing, and we would be flying north up the coast, but we're not in the Keys. We're in the Bahamas. So we're flying up the coast, but we're, you know, a hundred miles out from the coast, off the east coast of Florida, flying parallel. And after Grand Bahama, we run out of islands. And so it's very hard to get your reference point once those islands disappear, right? Okay, we can see Grand Bahama really well now. So Grand Bahama is the big brown strip. You see how the clouds form just above the islands? How we had very few clouds out over the water, but the clouds form over the islands? That's how you can find islands in the Bahamas. Sailors and pilots know that clouds form over islands. So yeah. why do you think clouds form over islands? Uh, I don't know. You want me to teach you? Yeah. All right, clouds form over islands because when the sun shines down, the ocean water doesn't get very much hotter, right? Yeah. It's going to say pretty much the, st the same temperature. But the land heats up and gets really hot. Like when you walk on a driveway and the driveway's burning hot on the bricks, right? The ground gets warm. All the
the heat from the island starts going straight up because heat rises. Same idea like a hot air balloon. Yeah. Okay, so if the heat rises, then it pushes the moisture that's in the air higher, 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 and then as it goes, it cools and it forms the clouds. So it's the, the currents that are caused by the rising heat that cause the clouds to form. Cool, huh? Yeah. All right, then, the next radio transmission of note was that we're on a heading of 030 degrees for 45 minutes, and then we'll fly north to make sure we're not over the Gulf of Mexico. So that's not good. So they're really, really lost now. At 5 o'clock, they said, change course 090 degrees due east for 10 minutes. 090 is straight out into the ocean. So after they flew up the wrong way for a while, then they flew even farther away from where they should be. All right, when we make this turn, I gotta make a radio call right around here, because we've got the ATIS right to the west of West the, End. The red so line. we need to call before we cross the ATIS. The red line. Yeah. I see What's an car? Air Defense Identification Zone. Where you gotta let so, the US know that you're coming back. If we don't tell them we're coming back in, then we will have some jets show up to help escort us back. We don't want Which that. will not be fun for anyone. Definitely not for me. Okay, so what happens if, if you get intercepted by jets? If you cross the ATIS and they send jets to meet you, then two jets usually will come up behind you. Now, I may be wrong because I've never been through this, but my understanding is two jets come up to meet you. One stays behind the plane and the other comes up beside you and then they tried to give you some communications. Uh, that means get on the radio emergency frequency. So 121.5 is where I would go over to. After we get some instructions and they've gotten things straightened out, if they fall behind and take off, then that means continue on, basically. If one of them goes in front of you and, and a jet ever takes off left or right, you are supposed to follow any jet that goes in front of you. It means, come on, follow me, and they're gonna take you back where they want you to land. So, I never wanna see jets. Oh. Uninhabited island. Another radio transmission came over that said, change course to 090 degrees, which is due east, for 10 minutes. In the same time, someone on the flight said, this is almost correct, so for the children washing. He said, that's not what he said. <laughs> he said, dang it, if we could just fly west, we could get home. He didn't say that either. He says, dang it, if we could just fly west, we could get home. Head west, dang it. He just said it more colorfully. So anyway, the weather started getting worse. Okay. Taylor says, we'll fly heading 270 degrees until landfall or until running out of gas. And he requested a weather check at 524. So that means they were out for about 3 hours and 15 minutes. Just wandering around up here before they started flying. 270 degrees. That was the perfect heading. That's the heading that they need to get back if they had enough fuel. So some land-based radio stations out on the Florida coast, they started to coordinate and triangulate the position of the planes to a 100 nautical mile radius, uh, somewhere to the east and to the north of where they started. So a search plane then went out 
to try to find the missing flight and start doing search patterns. But at 6.04, which was 45 minutes or so, he, put, he said on the radio, holding 270, we didn't fly far enough east, we might as well turn around and fly east again. Right, so, you want to know what the last message was before they disappeared? Yeah. They, the last radio message that ever got heard from Flight 19 was, all planes close up tight, we'll have to ditch unless landfall. When the first plane gets below 10 gallons, we all go down together. So remember, they're, they're, in, they're in bad weather. There's clouds all around. When they get down below 10 gallons, they're going to all go down together and ditch in the ocean together. And they did, and they all disappeared together. They still haven't been found. Wow. Do you know about the rescue ship? No. There's a flying boat, like a big seaplane. And then the rescue ships got sent out and lost too? Yep. They went out of Banana River. Cool place, right? Yeah. Uh, Banana, River. Banana River. So, Naval Air Station Banana River, now is called Patrick Air Force Base. They sent out a PBM-5 Mariner. It had 13 people. So, big search and rescue ship. And, uh, how do you think that one ended? Do you think Lost they found two. it? I gotta start thinking about my next move also. We're gonna go ahead and squawk. One, nope, two, one, three. Unfortunately, though the story continued within the plane, several of our cameras, including the in-flight cockpit audio recorder, inexplicably failed at this portion of the trip. Just another of many mysterious failures within the Bermuda Triangle, and frankly, better our cameras than an engine or the avionics. The story regarding the Lost Mariner continued following its departure with a routine radio message at 7.30 p.m. After the transmission, this plane was never heard from again. At 9.15, a tanker reported it had observed flames from an apparent explosion leaping 100 feet high and burning for 10 minutes in the approximate position of the aircraft. The PBM aircraft was known to accumulate flammable gasoline vapors in its bilges, and professional investigators have assumed that the Mariner most likely exploded in midair while searching for Flight 19. Because of the loss of our cameras, footage of the remainder of the flight back to Fort Lauderdale and then home to Stewart was very limited. In lieu of the landing, we're going to end this video with a quick and well-deserved tribute to Kevin, my instructor who helped make this Flight 19 recreation flight possible.